Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And a lot of the questions come up, where is dentistry headed? So I have one of the major influencers and authority figures in all of dentistry. And we're also going to ask where may we want it to go with Dr. Dan Fisher from UltraDent. So you are not going to want to miss this. Do not miss this. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show, and we are having so much fun shooting all of these. And again, we're just getting a lot of feedback per hour. What do you want to see? And one of the hot topics that comes up all the time is where is dentistry headed? So I've got one of the top guys in all of dentistry here to ask that question, and where may we want it to head? Now, before I introduce our guest, couple show notes. Uh, we are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you have a question, feel free to add it to the feed and I will ask Dr. Fisher myself and we'll get the answer directly from him because we want to make sure that you guys are getting what you want out of each one of these episodes. The other thing is we love your questions so much and we're getting so many good questions that we're giving away a free Apple iWatch along with two tickets to our practice growth seminar called Activate that is crazy inspiring for your team. So you don't want to miss that. So if you have a great question, ask it. We'll entertain it and make sure we get you a good answer. Now, my guest today is a tremendous human being with an incredible story. And a lot of you already know who he is, even if you don't know him intimately. Uh, Dr. Dan Fisher, who started Ultradent, I, I think, you know, so, so Dan, um, I know who you are and I've heard a little bit of your story, but I want you to tell the viewers, if no one's heard of Dr. Dan Fisher, who is Dan Fisher? Well, Dan Fisher is a, a guy who grew up one of many kids in a large family and uh, had the good fortune to be able to go to college, which was not even the norm from the society I came out of. Had the good fortune to be able to go to dental school, learn about other people, other ways of living, and certainly living about learning about dentistry. And uh, going to school in Loma Linda, Southern California, uh, and with my unique Mormon root, they called me a Seventh-day Mormon when I was down in Loma Linda, but I was groomed and trained by some of the finest clinicians ever back in the golden era of gold through the early, uh, through the late 60s, early 70s, uh, which continued on up into the mid 80s. And obviously dentistry changed immensely from, from that time to now. But uh, having the need to work on large families, uh, uh, large polygamous families actually, Kirk, uh, from Southern Utah and, and around uh, I had to rethink my dentistry, and I had to find more efficient, more productive ways to deliver quality dentistry, even to mass-produce quality dentistry. And it was really the needs that I had for my own practice that spawned, that generated the motivation to create our earliest products, which we refer to as our legacy products at, at this time. Uh, fast forward that to the last... Uh, 10, 15 years, and yeah, I get spoiled. I get to work with a whole lot of young engineers and chemists and the like, and they teach me now. And uh, That's fun to be able to learn from those young ones. Uh, but there's been a lot of water going under the bridge from those earliest days of dental school until now. And, and certainly we can see how much dentistry has changed. And some of it, I believe, is, is good. I think uh, some of it is, is not so good. And that's why I like that qualifier in there. Where may we want dentistry to be going? versus just where is it going. Yeah. And I would imagine in your time, you have seen so many radical changes. I mean, take us through that journey. And as somebody who cares a lot about this profession, what have you seen and why is this question so important? And then let's get into the details of it. So tell yeah, us your I, thoughts on that. I, I think we can jump right into the meat of it. And it has to do with that ever important word in basic. Mm -hmm. Now, there is times in medicine, there's times in dentistry that 
the only logical solution is via an invasive treatment. But as a general rule, the less we can be, the more we can minimize our invasiveness, uh, the more we can respect the human tissues, the, the longer those human tissues have the probability of lasting functioning and contributing to the, to the normal health and well-being of our patients, uh, those we serve. And clear back from uh, my early days in dental school, we had the type of dentistry that was more invasive, that was uh, uh, maybe on lace, crowns, ear-to-ear roundhouse uh, reconstructions of which I participated in. I love full mouth reconstruction. But something that I learned, and especially from having to work on people who didn't have the money for ear-to-ear crown and bridge, was that I could address their needs with less invasive procedures and that in a nice side benefit, it could even be more affordable, allowing me to even reach more social economic groups and still make a great income, uh, even reducing the amount of laboratory work uh, required or in today's world, perchance reducing the expensive uh, CAD CAM equipment and machine blocks and the like. So that's, that's kind of a the yin and the yang of, of mm-hmm. where dentistry has been, where our challenges are today, I believe. I, I believe to my bootstraps that, that being a doctor, it, it's critical that we remember that oath of at least doing no harm. Right, right. And I, I couldn't agree more. Now, what created this push that you see right now? What do you think are some of the factors behind it? Because if I'm a young dentist watching this, maybe I'm 32 and I'm just getting started, how would I how would I best understand what's what's happened in dentistry and where we're at right now? Yeah, I think there's many factors that can come into play. Obviously, uh, you usually are you usually get what you're rewarded for, mm-hmm. and certainly uh, the way insurance companies have gone, they tend to reward a lot more for the indirect type of dentistry than the direct place. And so that can give, it, if not a conscious and unconscious incentive to, uh, uh, to clinicians to, uh, and especially when they have a stack of bills to pay, including their tuition bills and the like, to, to maybe lean a little more towards that, uh, that indirect route when possibly a, a, a bonded direct restoration could have met the need, preserved more tooth structure, and perchance done correctly even lasted longer. So it, it gets down into a subject of, of ethics to a, to a significant degree and, and what we feel good with. Now, now, obviously, not everybody's hand skills are the same. Not everybody's talents are the same. And it could be for any given set of dentists that it might be better to have a lab technician or a CAD uh, CAM type of device creating more of the architecture of the anatomy and the like. Uh, but as a rule, the, the more we as dentists can understand, picture, see, uh, beginning with the end of mind and create uh, directly in the oral cavity, where whenever and wherever reasonably possible, I, I think that's a positive. I, I think we should be proud as dentists to say, hey, I, I do have good hand skills and, and I, I can use my hands uh, I often say that the dentistry, uh, dentists in large, part of our brains are in our head and the other part of our brains are in our hands and, and using our hands and being skilled and proud of it. That, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah, absolutely. And you, again, you've seen all of this in dentistry. How much of self-awareness plays a role in this? Because, you know, you describe your journey, you did it all. And then there's a certain point where you wake up and you're like, that's not what it's about anymore. I've got to start really doing the right thing where before I might, I was doing what I thought I had to do. Um, and I chalk it up. I even had my challenges, uh, you know, arrogance of youth where you just don't know enough. And then you realize you're when you turn 30, you go, man, there's a lot I don't know. And then at 40, you wonder if you know anything. I mean, how much does that play in a role in dentists that you speak to? Because, again, you get to see them at all different levels. They have to be aware and kind of wake up in the middle of this process. Right. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of it uh, that there's, there can be many meeting, meetings, both uh, within arm's length. And a lifetime away in the phrase, begin with the end in mind, Mm -hmm. relative to creating at arm's length. Yes, you want to create a mental picture of of how the contours need to be, the emergence form, where you want your ABC contacts, and where do the mammalians need to flow. 
But ideally, the sooner, be it a 30, 40, 50, ideally 20 or 25, the sooner we could say, what do I want to be known for at the end of my life? What type of dentistry do I want to be providing uh, throughout my career? And, and I think there's a very nice check that, that can be used for, for dentists when asking themselves this question. And, and uh, I owe this to a, a lovely uh, oral surgeon colleague out of United Kingdom, uh, Martin Kelleher. Uh, back in 1998, uh, we found the need to bring a lawsuit against the British government. And we came to learn we were the first medical device company, dentistry being lumped among the medical device companies, the first in 22 years to bring a lawsuit against the British government. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is we had our opalescence tooth bleaching uh, product, uh, which could alleviate disfiguring colors, ugly smiles and the rest, uh, preserving the enamel, preserving the dentin and, and much more affordable than say ceramic veneers and crowns. Well, Martin, Martin came to know us, not because he was our first choice as an expert witness, he was an oral surgeon, albeit he did practice some prosthodontics as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, the original individual who was more of an expert in this area, uh, with pressure from the British government and not wanting to rock the boat, uh, he bowed out. And, and Martin had the courage to step into that position. And with his fabulous testimony and his conviction and reminding the judge of, of what life is about and what dentistry can be about, that we can help more social economic groups smile. We can we can help more people keep their enamel and their dentin by a by a minimal invasive tooth bleaching. That's doing right things for right reasons. Mm -hmm. And we won that first case. That the, the, the case went for a whole week, and uh, we won it in a sec sixty nine page verdict from the judge that was exquisite. It was elegant, in fact. But uh, Martin's been known to to kind of create a little ruckus in UK now and then as he sees this more invasive, invasive digital type of dentistry marching forward. And he likes to say, does it pass the daughter test? Does mm. it pass the daughter test? Okay, for a, a lady dentist, does it pass the son or the daughter test? Okay, right. and we talk about what we do it with our spouse. Uh, for, for dads that have little daughters, that can really hit home. And right. for, for a mom as well, would I, would I extract that tooth and put in an implant? Or would I perchance uh, uh, try to do a, a quality root canal treatment first? Or certainly, if, if I can intervene and catch that carious lesion before it exposes the pulp, what would be my treatment for my daughter? Does it mm -hmm. pass the daughter? And, and I, think, I think that can be a quick gut check on us as to are we doing right things for right reasons? Yeah. Well, I have three of them. So that hits me right in the gut because it's amazing how much you will protect your daughters with your life. I Absolutely. Mean, every, you, Absolutely. You want, the, you want you only the best. in front of a roaring train to pull them off the track before you let them get blemished. Right. Well, I've noticed that even now in orthodontic treatment, I'm like, we are going to take our time. I'm in no hurry. We're going to do the right thing. So um, it's funny you should ask that question. Uh, it's a good one. Very good one. And, you know, when you watch the trends, again, let's dig into this, that where you think dentistry is headed and what you see. Because, you know, you hear this a lot of time from people. It, it's changed more in the last five years than it's changed in the last 20. Would you agree with that statement? I agree or and I disagree. I, I think the modality in which, for example, indirect restorations are created has changed, but whether that indirect's done in a lab or by a CAD CAM, the treatment can be somewhat similar. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen this change come uh, quite dramatically, say, since the advent of adhesive dentistry, uh, the late 80s until now, and I just see it continuing to escalate, and yeah, I think the curve is getting a little steeper each year. And, and some of that can be because uh, older mentality dentists, such as myself, may be retiring, leaving the scene, and we have a younger group coming in, and uh, de uh, dental students and dentists who have even grown up more with 
digital type of uh, toys and tools mm-hmm. and the rest. And uh, so all of that weighs into this. But I think regardless of the tools, of the toys, if you will, we always need to give ourselves the gut check. Would right. I do it on my daughter? Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny you say that too, because uh, now I instantly start recalling 20 years ago when I got involved with this, got involved with Pete Dawson and a lot of, you know, uh, some great, we used the word preceptorships 20 years ago, where people were responsible for making sure you developed the right way and had the right thought processes. And one of the things that came up consistently was, you know, when you're talking to a patient, you want to let them know, I want to do the least amount of dentistry on you during the course of your life. So we're going to be proactive. And this isn't just dentistry. You could make this argument about uh, cardiologists. You could make this argument almost about every aspect of medicine, couldn't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. The more you can educate them to be no more dependent on you than what they really need to be, the more you've really fulfilled your title doctor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the original Greek meaning of doctor is to be teacher. And Mm -hmm. and certainly... uh, too often that can get passed off to those uh, who don't have the DR in front of their name. And, and a lot, a lot of people can miss out and including the doctor. Right. Right. And then uh, even, you know, I want you to talk about the advancements of materials too, because growing up in an age where I saw a lot of full mouth reconstructions uh, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a product of a dentist who's a phenomenal clinician. He's like, we're not going to cut those teeth. We're going to just do some very simple things because the materials advance so well, we don't have to cut that virgin tooth material. Can you just talk about the progress that's happened on that side with materials? Yeah, Kirk, give you said what I've been saying. You get a dentist like that and you don't want to go anywhere else, do you? And right. then now that's one of those uh, long lasting rewards of going to a dentist that you know really cares about you, that really wants to preserve your natural. But now to your specific question is what has changed in these materials? Well, this has been evolving over some time. Uh, it was in 19, oh, don't quote me here exactly, but somewhere around the, the late 50s, early 60s, the Bonacore invented the acid etching of enamel. And, and it took a, uh, over a decade or 15 years before dental schools felt comfortable putting acid on enamel to, to be able to bond to enamel. Mm-hmm. And then along came uh, 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 Ray Bowen, who invented composite in the mid-60s. Uh, anybody who ever gets a chance to meet Ray, do yourselves a favor. This guy is one of the most exquisite, humble, kind, curious, hardworking scientists in his 90s, uh, mm-hmm. still, still giving a heck. But uh, after inventing composite, there became a number of iterations of composites and numerous improvements and resins changing and particle sizes changing. But we still had this major limitation and we really couldn't adhere well to dentin. But Ray Bowen not only was responsible for inventing composite, but he invented the first viable dentin bonding agent. And those continue to change dramatically through the 90s and through the early part of 2000. But then in a sad way, in the name of speed and in in the name of simplicity, uh, many of the current contemporary adhesives do not bond to mental mother dent near to the level that many of the agents that we used in the the mid-90s, early 2000s did. Mm -hmm. But if we just follow the progress of the evolution of the technologies, boy, it, it it just makes me cringe when, when I hear dentists say, well, a, a composite is only going to last three and a half years, or it's only going to last five and a half years, or uh, all of these numbers. It's so important to remember that a composite's not a composite, it's not a composite. And, and that goes way beyond just brand. It goes so much to the technique and what type of bonding agents and what type of care were used when those bonding agents were placed or before they were placed to make sure that all the soft soft uh, decalcified dentin was removed and and what sort of curing light was used uh, was that resin totally polymerized was that bonding totally polymerized was the isolation appropriate it's right. just a bad 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 mistake to say composites only last this long when there are such a wide range of quality relative to composites relative to the professionalism with which they're placed in it, it's something we need to jerk on our own bridle on and, and say look let, let's let's think this through a bit let's let's not be so dogmatic 
Yeah, absolutely. And and just speak about the future of the materials, you know, because you are behind the scenes, you're senior. Tell us what's going to be happening to further aid that just in the next two, three, four years. What can we expect if we don't get to see through the lenses you get to see? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I have to be kind of careful uh, on how much I disclose as to what we're right. on, you know, because I understand that this is to all dental industry, dental personnel, competitors, and all the rest are, but, right. but certainly we're, we're always wanting to find better, easier ways for dentists to accomplish the same thing, as long as we don't make a significant compromise in the, in the process. A uh, case in mm-hmm. point that I just mentioned was relative to that and bonding agents, uh, if we can simplify that, we should, as long as we don't make too great of a compromise in it. If we can improve the handling of the composites, we should, as long as we don't make too great a compromise. Anything we can do with composites to reduce shrinkage stress, uh, which can somewhat but not always directly be related to volumetric shrinkage, we should always do that. So, so there's room for those to improve. Certainly in, in the indirect realm and with the migration of CAD CAM, there's definitely <clears throat> opportunities to improve there. Uh, uh, something that I feel is, is a subject that we should be getting more serious on in dentistry is looking at the type of materials that we are uh, uh, attempting to bond and replace in the oral cavity. Yes, uh, are these materials capable of, of adhering uh, in a strong way? We, we read, we see graphs, we see studies about bonding agent A, B, C, bonding at X, Y, Z, bond strengths. But how often do we see what is the adhesion of that bonding agent and or that cement to the man-made material? It's, it's the mutual attraction that can be the weak link many times. And that's even one of the reasons in my more recent lectures, I'm creating an analogy of how Creating quality, long-lasting dentistry is like creating a quality, long-lasting marriage. And as my bride, the, my redhead of 44 years now, uh, mm-hmm. she has reminded me for years that she feels that the thing that gave us the greatest opportunity to, for our marriage to succeed and to last a long time is we happen to have a strong mutual attraction. And we mm-hmm. forget the mutual part in creating right. quality, long-lasting dentistry. We know right. On to dent that XYZ or enamel. But what are the adhesive strengths to the zirconia, sandblasted, mm-hmm. to the to the set to the micro braided metal, uh, hydrofluoric etched, uh, lithium disilicate or, or felspatic? What are these mutual attractions? What is the mutual adhesion capability between the adhesive and a resin composite, for example? Uh, as it turns out, that happens to be the highest of any mutual attraction that we work with in dentistry because we have we get molecular cross-linking between the adhesive resin that's polymerized and the and the uh, monomer of the composite that then polymerizes and cross-links with the, the adhesive. So th- these are important aspects. It's uh, there can be many similarities between creating quality, long-lasting dentistry and creating a quality, long-lasting marriage and right out of the gate for modern operative dentistry, which has to be thinking adhesive. Do you have a strong mutual attraction? I love that. Now, I was talking to a mutual friend of ours this morning, Dr. Bob Marges, and I said, Bob, I got Dan on this afternoon. He's like, oh, you tell him. First of all, I love that guy. Secondly, that guy has one of the strongest integrity, you know, decision-making uh, core value systems I've ever seen. That guy will always do the right thing. And so I'll just give you the shout out. He said, say that. And I, and I, I said, without question. So I can see where this is headed. Well, um, I, I, and wanna, I, I wanna reciprocate on his behalf. Uh, uh, one good stroke deserves another, Dirk. Right. Uh, right. I, I've been to Bob McGarris's office. I, I've seen the type of dentistry he does and he's driven for quality and he's principled and, and, and you love that. And, Certainly, he's never hurting for energy. He's he's no. pounding on ten of eight cylinders. Yeah, and he dirt he doesn't need the money, so he just does it because he yeah. loves it. Now, 
I want to take what you said about the mutual, mutual adhesion and let's just throw in the age component because I, I want to know if you agree with this. Most economists in the United States agree that it's not health care, um, you know, and it's not um, the economy that's the challenge. It's the aging population. I mean, we are a, we are a population of people that's going to get older and older and older. People are going to be living longer. One in three babies that's born today will actually live to be 100. So when you talk about these materials, they're going to have to be more natural, long lasting, don't you agree? I mean, that's really one of the opportunities that young dentists have to understand is, number one, they're going to be practicing longer. Number two, their patients, these young dentists are going to have patients living well up into their 100 range sometimes, in late 90s. Yes, and, and it's so, so important that you brought that up. And, and certainly, we can't forget the, the other preventive needs that are out there. And, and at present, uh, fluoride is still our strongest weapon that we have outside of oral hygiene for for helping address many of these needs. But yes, as you age, everything else being equal, salivary glands start to dry up more. And with the various modern medications, the salivary glands can even shut down almost entirely. And then we get this rampant root carries and the like. But I do believe that a lot of work is being done in that arena. We're doing work in that arena to help prevent the carious lesion, to help reduce the incidence of root carries. It's so important with our aging populations, if you, as you have very accurately pointed out. But I think it's important with just what you've said, that every young dentist, every old dentist, when they look at that 12-year-old kid, that 18-year-old guy, that 25-year-old guy, before they pick up that high speed in the burr and touch it to the tooth, remind yourself, this patient may live beyond 100 years of age. I jokingly say I'm going for 150 years myself. Me too. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. And if you keep that in mind, once you cut that once in a lifetime enamel and dentin away, it's gone. It's gone. So do I really need to do that or can I keep it longer? I think it's also important to remember, and, and, and this I get reminded of virtually every time I lecture, there'll, there'll be some dentists come up at break or whatever. They might even raise their hand in the audience and they'll say, you know, I, I have dedicated my practice to older patients or I'm calling on patients in nursing homes. And they'll say, do you know who are the most challenging patients to address the root caries challenges with? And I'll just let them keep talking because I like it to come out off of their lips. Mm -hmm. And they'll say it's the patient who had lots of money and who got a lot of full coverage crowns. Because when that root caries decays interproximally, subgingually, under those crowns, that's the biggest challenge I have to contend with. And right. that be the biggest deal to try. It, well, it's, it, it's a scab of a repair if you try to gain access from the buckle, heaven forbid the lingual, but all of the games and hoops that you go through, the, the, more, the more we can keep the margins of our restorations uh, accessible for cleaning around it, and who knows, the, the next magic bullet after fluoride and, and the like that can come along to gain access to those margins, thinking for preventing opportunities that, that haven't even been conceived yet, uh, that's a big deal. What would I do to my daughter? This daughter of mine is hopefully going to live long past me. Am I treating her today so that she's going to have the best chances going forward for remaining dentate and ideally with her natural teeth, her beautiful natural smile and the like? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, uh, I completely agree. Now I'm going to answer the question, question, question that, that I get all, I get all the time, time which, is which is sometimes, sometimes when we educate younger dentists, younger dentists and they say, you know, you know the older the older generation spends too much time in the ideal. Uh, us uh, us younger, younger dentists, dentists don't have the ability to choose. We had Dr. Chris Rangers. Say, Kurt, you're cracking up real bad. Oh, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me a little better? Okay, so a lot of young dentists say they don't have the choice to practice sometimes the way they want to choose. And Dan, you ask a great question, but how would you respond to that to a young dentist that says, hey, look, I don't have the choice that you're talking about because of the environment that I'm in. I, I just want to eliminate that roadblock as it comes at us. So what would you say to that? Yeah. And I'm going to be significantly sympathetic to that to a certain degree. Uh, 
Right. In other words, versus young dentists coming out of dental school today, their their debt load compared right. to what we older guys had, it, it can be immense. And the opportunity for them to go borrow a pile of money to start a solo practice, to start from scratch, that can be a challenge. And so, yes, many of them do end up in group practices. But I would encourage this. You know, when, when that dentist is looking at the various group practices and who are the candidates of who I may want to work for, start interviewing them and ask pointed questions and find out how much freedom you have and find out what their ethical values are. I, I, I've, I've met some, some uh, uh, primary uh, uh, decision makers in large group practices who, who've had darn good ethics. And mm -hmm. it, just like a dentist is not a dentist is not a dentist, a composite is not a composite, not a composite. Study, you know, make sure that you're aligning with a firm that you can hold your head proud with. You can at least accept if you're making compromises, they're minimal. They're not ones that cause you to have to change your character, change mm -hmm. your value system and the like. And I think more of the young dentists, when they're interviewing, can hold to that the more the message will come through to these large group practices. But I, I think it's already come through to a lot of them from what I yeah. see. Yeah, absolutely. And if you will, you know, everybody's going to want to know this question. Where do you see us in two or three years? Now, I'm going to preface that by saying dentistry has been consistently wrong. Okay, when fluoride came onto the scene, everyone thought dentists would disappear. You know, 20 years ago, they said PPOs would disappear. That never happened. I mean, we've been wrong at all of our predictions. But if you were to loosely say, hey, look, and you and I do this again in two years, what are we going to be looking at and what will we see? Yeah, well, we're, we're in the middle of seeing this transition in, in, in many ways. Certainly just as societies change, that has a dramatic effect on, on dentistry. I mean, today and in two, three years from now, and even more so in five, 10 years from now, to achieve, to obtain a pleasing smile, it, it's no longer a want. Just, mm -hmm. We dentists need to just subtract this want versus need subject out of our brains. Right. When a patient comes in and says, you know, I really want this straightener. I'd, I'd like this to be a little brighter, wider and whatnot. Just get out of your mind asking, well, is that really a want or a need? In today's society, want virtually equals need. And, and certainly, uh, even if someone evaluates it different, nobody ever can climb inside of the brain of the patient and find out why that's such an important quote, want and to mm -hmm. them. Uh, I came to learn years ago that, that mental health is more important than dental health every time. And this continues to evolve and it, it continues to develop. And it's really a credit to a society when, when wants and needs become virtually superimposed. It tells you that our quality of life, our standard of living, it's, it's continuing to improve and to increase. And, and that's just going to continue to go on and on and on. I'm hoping relative to a bright vision of the future that we will see a number, a significant number at least, of, of young dentists really say, hey, how do I want my daughter treated? Right. Do I really want to whittle all that down to make room for all that man-made stuff and reduce so much actually to give all of the dimension necessary for the zirconia plus the philosophatic fire on top of it or whatever else? Mm -hmm. What do I really want for my daughter? That's where I like to see dentistry going. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, Melanie Jones uh, quoted you, mental health is more important than dental health. I absolutely love that too. Um, what do you, I always like, I love to ask this question to people that have, uh, have done a lot, you know, and see, have seen a lot. What do you know for sure? When you look back on a career, a great career like you've had, what do you know for sure? And what would you say to a young dentist getting started other than what you've already shared? Well, I, I'm going to repeat some of what uh, you said. Namely, I can remember in dental school, there was a vaccine coming that was supposed to end or eradicate all tooth decay. And, and we hear about this every few years. And there could be some university that has worked out some vaccine. Well, right out of the gate, there's something that's very important to remember that, that most dentists don't realize. They get a vaccine approved today. 
it can be hundreds of millions of dollars in 10 to 15 years to, mm -hmm. to, to get it through FDA versus back uh, when SOC got the, uh, uh, the, the vaccine for polio. You know, that, that was so quick, so simple, so easy. Today, the large studies that have to be run and the companies, they have to prove not only that it's safe and effective for all of the potential patients who would receive it, but they have to make sure that it doesn't interfere or cause problems with all the other vaccines that that patient may end up getting and that have already been approved. So from a practical standpoint, those things are they're out there ways. Okay, we may come up with some, some other topical type of, of uh, uh, solutions and, and better ways to deliver fluoride and, and potent, potentially better ways to deliver calcium phosphate, albeit our saliva is still the best delivery vehicle for calcium phosphate. And unless our salivary glands have dried up, we're delivering a whole lot of calcium phosphates and the like by our saliva. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, really, I think we need to remember that in spite of what we're told, just like I was told as a young dentist, or you were told, Kirk, that we won't be needing dentists uh, near as much, and, and kids, their, their diets are getting better, and, and their hygiene's better. Boy, you know, that cycles. And uh, just in my lifetime, I've seen carries reduce, and then go back up, and people rest on their oars, and people slack off, and different demographic situations come and occur. I tell Dennis when, I, when I'm lecturing to him that if we could eradicate caries today, we'd still need more dentists. Mm -hmm. These are like tires. They're good for so many miles. The treads wear out. The sidewalls, the flexing and the bending, they give out. We're talking about keep people living beyond 90, 100, 120, you and me, Dirk, 150. <laughs> okay. Gee whiz. I mean, we're going to put a whole lot of wear on those tires. And if our teeth are virgin, clear up to age 70 or 80, we're probably going to need some retreads in there. Mm -hmm. and we might need some sidewalls uh, repaired. So we, we shouldn't write dentistry off. It's not, it's not the good guys writing off into the sunset. The good guy dentists are going to be needed for generations to come. For a very, very long time. So what questions haven't I asked you that I should have asked you? Anything, any, any last thoughts you have, Dan, on this? Because I love this conversation. Yeah, I, I, I think there's still a, a, a lot more potential for tooth whitening than what mm -hmm. people see. Now, some dentists have realized how that helps them grow their practice. But it, it, in my mind, it, it's one of the more ethical offerings that we can provide to patients because it's the ultimate of minimal invasive. And, and so often, smiles can be enhanced dramatically just by getting rid of some of the dark stuff that's in there. And again, tied to changing societies, what was acceptable as an A3 back when I was a young dental student. Wow, that's not acceptable anymore. And, and the first patient of mine after myself, at least with opalescence, was my 14-year-old daughter, Jelena. And uh, she says, Dad, I need my teeth whiter. Dad, I need my teeth whiter. And I'm going, well, she said want. And I foolishly then was saying, well, you want to love it. They're just A3. And I even took my Vita Shade Guide home and I I showed her that A3 was quite a ways over on the left-hand scale. You know, it, uh, yeah, it was yeah. uh, fairly uh, bright compared to the lower value of the darker shades. Dad, I need my teeth whiter. Dad, I want my teeth whiter. And, and, and finally, yeah, she was the first one bleached with opalescence. And in the first night, she went from an A3 to an A1. But what she shared with me some years later, she said, you know, Dad, I was being teased in school. The kids told me I was dirty, that I didn't brush my teeth. And they knew that my father was a dentist, so they twisted the knife. And yeah, it, it, there are many things beyond just our control that causes these, these needs, these wants to become needs. Uh, and, and I think there's still a lot of opportunity there to help more human smile and for an affordable price. Uh, I, I think that's win for the patient, win for the dentist. And there's so many convenient, easy ways to do that nowadays. Uh, our opalescence go is, is the latest on the scene with a, a non-customized tray that's pre-filled, ultimate ease, ultimate comfort. It's just not that big a deal. So mm -hmm. let's, let's help more people smile and, and, and for affordable prices and, that's good for them and good for us. 
Yeah, making the world a better place, buddy. I really, really appreciate this conversation. I'm going to have you back. We're going to have uncover some other topics because I'm, I'm sure you could talk for a very long time on some other things that you're passionate about. So I really appreciate this. Now, if if Dan, if, if people want to learn more about you, you know where the, where can they find you and um, tell us how we could reach out to you and maybe ask you more intimate questions about this subject. Subject. Yeah, I, I'm sure through our website and addressing through uh, Melanie Jones, who uh, addresses uh, many of our social media uh, issues and the uh, our, uh, promotions and the like and education. If they contact through her, she'll see that it comes to me. Yeah. And I'm just going to shout out about your blog. You write an incredible blog. It's, it's fantastic. So, um, you got to check that out. So thank you, buddy. Pre- really, really appreciate this. And so just stay on for a few seconds. I want to chat with you just after we finish. But if you're watching this and you have questions for Dan uh, or uh, just questions in general, please add them to the feed even after the live show. And again, we want to try to get you the answers that you're looking for because this is a great debate uh, about the future of this incredible profession. So um so thank you very much. So Dan, really appreciate you being on, buddy. I, I, I'm so grateful and uh, we're going to continue to have more conversations. So thank you all for watching. Really appreciate it. And until we see you next time, keep watching the Best Practices Show. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.